السلام على رسول الله أما بعد So the G is understood to mean gratitude, all right? We will cover the definition of gratitude. We will deal with the three parts of gratitude. And we will also explain how gratitude is shown throughout those three parts. The next letter in the word grateful is R. And that stands for reflection. The definition of reflection, we will deal with reflecting over the creation reflecting over one's own creation, meaning reflecting on yourself, as well as reflecting over one's thought process and reflecting over one's behavior, understanding the desire and how to control one's desire. Heedlessness is the enemy of reflection. Okay, uh, we will deal with that when we get to the R. The letter A is attitude. The definition of attitude. We will deal with that, the power of perception. We will deal with the power of optimism. Controlling one's anger will be in this particular uh, coping mechanism. Uh, also, good character, positive outlook versus a ne negative one, and the ill effect of pessimism. All right, uh, we will talk about that. Now remember, each of these letters represent a week. So we will go over those things within that week, like we said. So G will be one week, R will be another week, inshallah, then A will be another week, and then the T will be the first four weeks of the course. It's an eight-week course. T stands for having good thoughts about Allah. All right? Actually, in Arabic, it's, um, you know, we've done the hus, and the hus. All right? Having good thoughts about Allah. All right? You might say, how is this a coping mechanism? Throughout the Quran and Sunnah, we will explain how having good thoughts about Allah serves as a coping mechanism for depression. All right? In this, we will cover the, the definition of having good thoughts, having good thoughts about the Creator, having good thoughts about one's own self, understanding evil insinuations, and how to ward them off. Okay? I think for the I am, as we know the famous uh, quote, even though it might be a little bit full Developing good eating habits. Eating has a direct effect on your body, thoughts, and behavior. Um, understanding what is Teslan, laziness. Um, the, posit the positive effect of exercising. Unhealthy e eating and its effects. The next letter is the F, which stands for the power and impact of faith. Amen. Okay. And we will deal with this. Faith is what strengthens the connection. 
uh, obedience, understanding morality versus immorality. Faith is shown through the heart, tongue, and limbs. And the enemy of faith is non-faith, which is disbelief. And the next letter is you. Now, you will cover understanding the three Ps. So what are the three Ps? That's patience, perseverance, and prayer. Understanding the three categories of the three, the three categories of patience, why patience is so important to fight depression, and depression is conquered through patience and gratitude. The last week, which is the last letter, will be L, and that's understanding love. Loving thyself, understanding self-esteem, and being confident in oneself. All right, that will deal with that. Okay, as an introduction, again, that will be, that's what the acronym is. So as an introduction, we want to start off with a nice saying, so that we can have a good saying here that encourages us. This beautiful saying is that whoever suffers from depression while the Quran is present, all right? While the Quran is in reach, it's like the one who is thirsty while water is present. Whoever suffers from depression while the Quran is in reach, it's like the one who is thirsty while water is present. All right? The understanding of this statement is that the Quran serves as a means to help cope with depression. And you should not overlook it. So while the Quran is in reach, meaning you can ascertain the Quran to help you cope with depression, anxiety, etc., etc., but if you overlook it, even though it's in close proximity to you, it's like someone's being thirsty while water being present. You should not get from this that any of the things that we talk about in this course is going to totally wipe away depression. We do not have that claim. We do not have the claim that anything that will be discussed in this course will remove anxiety, depression from you in totality, because that would not happen. One of the side effects, if you want to call it, of living in this world, when our parents were expelled from the paradise, is that there will be hardship, that there will be grief, that will, there will be difficulties, there will be calamities. There will be things that you will experience. Allah Jalla did not promise us in the Quran that we will be free without experiencing any of those things when our parents were expelled from the paradise. Right. Continue. In today's society, there are so many who are suffering from depression, grief, and anxiety, and are looking for solutions for these disorders and problems. The reader will find before him, or you guys, the student will find before him, a course which will address and offer some solution for such problems. The name of this course is called Grafer. Grafer is an acronym in which each letter stands for a coping mechanism to help one with such disorders. In light of this, it should not be understood that this course seeks to discredit the status, work, and profession of the experts in this field. Nor is this to serve as a treatment to those suffering from clinical depression. Those who are tested with severe form of depression have strongly been advised to consult with an expert in that field. So I want to make that clear as I said before. Also, I want to let you, let you guys know that the Quran and Sunnah is older than psychology in the Western world. Psychology in the Western world is roughly about 200 years old as a science and a discipline. Psychology in the Western world, which deals with this issue, mental health, is roughly about 200 years old. Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah is older than that. Why is I'm pointing this out? Because this course will be based off of the Quran and the Sunnah. And it will be off the works of a prolific scholar who is known as Ibn al-Qayyim al al-Jaziyah who has been given the nickname by his peers from the Ulama Tabib al the doctor of the heart and we will be using many of his works uh, throughout this course 
to deal with and tackle uh, these issues as far as the coping mechanism. So I know a lot of us get hung up on the fact that we somehow think that the Western approach to psychology is the best way to deal with these issues, and it's not. Because until recently, the Western psychology will focus mainly and solely on the brain, all right, on the physical, the environment that one lives, one pattern or one behaviors and thoughts, and they would not put too much stock into faith-based methods. They would not put too much stock. They just recently start to incorporate or to you know, incorporate the understanding of the impact that faith has on the psychology that faith has on dealing with mental health issues and so forth. But the psychology of an Islam, which was laid down years ago, talking about in the seventh century, but many of the scholars of the past, and from likes from the likes of them, we have uh, Sheikh Osama Tania, who explains that there is components that you must understand that man consists of. You have that which is known as the aqal, all right, which is an Arabic word, and we're going to explain what the aqal is. And you have that which is known as the nafs, which is the soul and the spirit of the person. And you have that which is known as the qari, the heart. And you have that which is known as the fitzula. All four of these things are truly important to understand how Islam approaches psychology versus how the West approaches psychology. All right, because mental health is from that area of psychology. So, Sheikh Rasulam and Kibiyah, he tells us that the heart and the intellect shares a relation. There's a relation that comes between the heart and the intellect. They normally call this the dimag, your brain, the dimag, and your color. In the Quran, Allah tells us that it is not, in Surah Tahaj, Surah 22, it is not their eyes that are blind, but it is their heart and their breasts. There are hadiths from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one famous one in particular, is when the Prophet Sallallahu said that there is a piece of a mukha for the justice. That's in the body. He that salah, if it is correct, then the rest of the body will be correct. If it is corrupted, then the rest of the body will be corrupted. And he said, indeed, he a qalb, Sadiq Kalakal Abu Fukhari, a Muslim, he said, it's the heart. So Islam understands that the heart is the seed of the intellect. The intelligence and so forth is from there. So not to get confused when we say the dimah. So Sheikh Osman Kimiya, he says that the heart is where these feelings, thoughts, and all those things will emanate from, and they will share a connection by going up to the brain, going down to the heart, all right, in that relation. But now where does the fitra fit in, in this whole equation? I have a piece of sheet, inshallah, next week, I mean the next week, I will give y'all a printout to the sheet of what we're talking about here. Islamic approach to psychology. The fitra is rather important because the Western psychology leaves it out. The fitra is many things. Allah Jalla says in Surah Tarum, which is Surah 30, Fatul Allah Nas. Right? Allah Jalla has created man upon a natural fitra. Fatra right? But Allah mentioned something that what? That there will not be no change in any creation of Allah. The fitra is that which has been explained by Shaykh Islam Kiyya, that which allows us to surrender and accept the truth when we hear it. If the truth is being presented to you, it's your fitra that allows you to incline toward it. They call it the any or the natural disposition of man. This is important. All of this is what mental health psychology goes back to, 
how do we understand the mind, how do we understand thought process, how do we understand behaviors which emanates from thought process, how do we understand the heart. And it's important that this is how our scholars tackle and deal with these issues, all right? Now, rather than the books offer another alternative perspective, if you will, which has been given less focus from the experts across the mental health world. When it comes to disorders such as depression, the experts in this field have developed a system to help tackle these disorders, which is known as biopsychosocial. Now, the biopsychosocial approach systemically, um, systematically considers biological, uh, psychological, and social factors and their complex interactions in understanding health, illness, and health care delivery. Grateful, however, is a force that addresses the perspective of spirituality, a faith-based alternative that can help tremendously in dealing with these disorders. For spirituality plays a significant role in treating such disorders, and is a form of disservice to dismiss it entirely, since man consists of a spirit, soul, mind, and body. So, the biopsychosocial model only focuses on two of these things, the mind and the body and totally neglects the spiritual essence of man. Taking this in consideration, we will deal with the works of the 7th century scholar named Shamsuddin, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr ibn Ibn Qayyim al Jazia, Rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He was a prolific scholar, producing a rich corpus of doctrine and literary works, and from these works, this course and book is formulated. In his famous book, al Wadis al he states, wrongdoing and sins are like the melodies of the heart, just as fever and pain are like the mal maladies of the body. So the scholars of the past, they understood that sins, transgression, and disobedience plays a significant or has a significant impact on our spirituality and on our heart, just like a fever Right? Or, physical, or physical illness we have on our body. All right? So they wouldn't neglect the two. And you might say, well, a lot of people chart it off when you hear people talk about mental health. They say, well, maybe he possessed by a gen, or she possessed by a gen. That's not actually the case. It's not necessarily always the case. Someone that is undergoing any form of mental health doesn't mean that they are being possessed by a gen. That is really not the proper way to approach it. Right? Um, however, there are scholars, like Ibn Alami, who have delved a little bit and into that and believe that the genes can mess with someone, but it doesn't mean that every case scenario or every case study means that that person is suffering from possession or dealing with a gene. It doesn't mean that. Also, to keep in mind is that anything that impacts you Spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, any of those things that impact or leave an impact, right, on you is or can incorporate what you call a traumatic experience. The Quran acknowledges that, the Sunnah acknowledges that. Henceforth, Allah Jalalali says what? Well, a never will one that will be shaken in a whole field of jewelry in one knuckles and men of Amwan when I'm fussy with them or off. Well, best she is far beneath. And it's important that you understand that the coping mechanism that Allah mentioned in this verse is soft. And this actually starts off with the statement of Allah, Ya Yu Ladina Amin, the Sainu, right? The Sabri was Salah, in the Mahama was far beneath. O you who believe, seek aid through patient prayer and perseverance. Right? Through patient prayer. And the law needed those who patient. Allah says, surely without a doubt, we should try you with uh, loss of life. We should try you with hunger. We should try you with fear. We should try you with uh, loss of fuse, recitation. We should try you with many of those different things you will experience. And all of those different things are what? Hardships, difficulties. You will experience those things. The law said, give glad tidings to those who are patient. Which is saying what? That you can bear those things. And patience is a means to cope with them. Your faith in you a way to understand them. 
It does not mean that you won't experience them or it will be removed. And it does not mean the law doesn't love you because you are experiencing some mental illness. Now, depression, for those who don't know, is like a deep hole. We like to describe it as an abyss. It's like a deep hole, right? And it is feed through that deep hole. That deep hole is it is fed through that deep hole because all you do is keep going further and further down if you do not allow yourself to combat it. If you stay in that state, it's going to pull you further down. Whether it's going, not the fact that you're feeling gloomy, but it's also going to what? Allow you to have bad thoughts about yourself, bad thoughts about the creation, bad thoughts about the creator. It's also going to make you feel gloomy, the smell, you I mean, smell that you don't want to do anything. You're feeling a little bit lazy, you don't want to move around because you're dwelling on whatever got you like that and it's hard for you, not just to accept, but maybe you might accept it, but it's hard for you to let go, all right? And so that's why we have this course designed to teach us how to cope with it. Not to get rid of it, but to cope with it, all right? You want to feel some of these things. You want to feel sad. The Prophet Salah some of them himself, as Allah says over and over throughout the Quran, do not grieve, Ya Muhammad, if they do not accept this message. Do not grieve, all right? Do not grieve. And however, we know that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi was a human, and he was a man, therefore he experienced the same uh, symptoms that humans experience, which is sadness, which is grief, all right? And he was the best of mankind. And he was the leader of the prophets and the messengers. Even so, he still experienced those things. All right? Uh, this statement of his highlights the right rule of spirituality. And just like the body experiences pain and different illnesses, so does the heart, which is a part of the spiritual realm. The heart plays a significant role in the life of man. In fact, the rest of the limbs follow the command of the heart. Most experts treating mental illness are unaware of the heart and its illnesses. Such neglect on their behalf caused them to not give much credence to the heart and its spiritual essence. We are informed in Islam that the success of any man depends on his heart being sound and not just his body and intellect alone. It is stated in an authentic narration that we quoted earlier. The Prophet says, Beware, there is a piece of flesh in the body. If it becomes reformed, the whole body becomes good. But if it gets for you, the whole body gets for you, and that is the heart. Allah Jalla states in the Quran, for in the hell of that is not indeed it is not the eyes that are blind, but I can talk about the blue that he fits the door, the eye that we quoted earlier, but it, however it is their hearts which are in their breasts and in their chest which are blind. Also has been stated elsewhere, Allah Jalla says in the in the feed. Uh, Allah says, Rally, this therein, in, therein is indeed a reminder for him who has a heart or gives fear why you see the point is have the heart. Allah Jalal says, Lahu the one who has a call, a heart. Alright, so the heart plays a vital role. This is important to understand because. If we don't address the issue of our heart, what is the state of your heart? The state of your heart is where you're going to find your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts. All that's going to be in there. How are you feeling with that? Someone comes to you and they ask you how you feel. That emanates from your heart, not your mind. All right? Your mind can play tricks on you, but your heart is the problem. And if you don't understand the state of the heart, what causes it to be in a good state or good condition, what are the signs of a good heart? What are the signs of a heart that is for you? Or what will cause the heart to be for you? Then this is a big problem and it's going to make it hard for you to cope with depression. All right? And this is why our scholars, when they deal with these issues, they deal with the heart. Like in this particular book here, from Ibn Al-Qayyim, the law of the fan, he goes over the heart extensively. He talks about the different types of hearts. All right? 
And you'll wonder why as our scholars honed in on that, because they, be they believe, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, and as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentioned, that the heart plays a significant role. That is the king of the limbs, the heart. All right? So that's why that is important. I hope that's not lost. All right? The verse above states that if a person has a heart, listen closely and becomes a witness, only then he or she can grasp the message of the Quran. This indicates that not everyone has a heart, meaning that the person's spiritual heart is not existing or dead. Because we know for sure that every living human being does possess a physical beating heart. This verse can thus only be alluded to the spiritual heart. Thus, this would be the focal point addressed in this particular course. Imam ibn Qayyim Rahimullah was asked a long question of which a part was, what is the opinion of the scholars regarding a man who was afflicted with a disease and knows that if he should continue, it would damage his life? The Imam quoted the hadith from Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet Sallallahu says, Allah has appointed a remedy for every disease that he has sent down. Allah has sent down a remedy, a cure for every disease which he has sent down. Imam Ahmed reported on his third year Usama ibn Sharif, right there on that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Tadawu fa inna Allah azza wa jal lam yada' da'an illa wada' lahu dawa. Right of that in Wa'i al-Haq. He says, Allah has not made a disease without providing a cure for it, with the exception of one disease, namely old age. There is no cure for old age because that's part of the process. Once a man, twice a child, as Allah says in Surah Rum, Allah what? Created you in a state of weakness, <laughs> and after that weakness, he gives you strength, and after that strength, he gives you weakness again. All right? Thus is the creation of Allah as a judge. Um, this applies to the medicine for the heart, soul, and body. The well-being of the servant's heart is far more important than of his body. For whilst the well-being of his body enables him to lead a life that is free from illnesses in this world, that of the heart ensures him both a fortunate life in this world and eternal bliss in the next. And this is why Sheikh Wafimim when he was given a lecture that's on YouTube to a group of doctors that deals with physical, physical doctors, that deal with the body, the anatomy. He told them that rather the diseases of the heart is more important than the diseases of the body. The diseases of the heart is more important, important than the diseases of the body. Okay? The Quran is not just a guidance for humanity in their lives, it is also a complete cure for everything. A complete cure. A cure for illnesses, a cure for diseases, and indeed a cure for bad hearts and souls. It is a book that when you read, listen, or learn will not only make all your problems disappear. However, I do not disagree with this. I disagree with the word. All right? Make all of your problems disappear. Because sometimes we think that if we experience a problem, right, the Quran is not working. <coughs> or the Sunnah is not working. That's not true. You can experience a problem, but it doesn't mean that Allah Jalla Allah loves you less. It doesn't mean that Allah is not having mercy on you. There are so many authentic narrations from our beloved messenger, so the lie of some of that, one of them is, if Allah loves a servant, what does he do? He put that servant to test. He calls that servant to go to trials. And we see that with who? Ayub, Job, in the Quran. What was Job's sin? There wasn't no sin that he committed that Allah caused him to undergo 18 years of that hardship. He went through a physical hardship with leprosy. He went through losing all of his children, losing all of his wealth. And throughout all of that, Allah Jalla said about him, and this is beautiful. Allah says, Inna who can I saw him. Allah actually mentioned that he was ever patient, but Allah says, Ni'mahat. How excellent of a servant was Ayu. How excellent was a servant that Ayu was. So, I'm only telling you this, I'm only saying this to remind us that what? All of your problems won't disappear. All right? But you will be able to deal with them. You will be able to deal with them and to properly understand them. All right? Throughout this course, you want to hear me quote Hassan um, Hassan the Muslim, one of the Tabi, the great Tabi. He had a beautiful statement. You want to hear me quote. And he explains that this is pretty much like the fit of life. 
We can't escape. He says that there is the servant goes between the two states. And he's never going to leave this state until we meet his Lord. Those two states is that either one, a blessing just came down, all right? And he's enjoying that blessing, which will soon pass on, and then a calamity will be strike him. And he will fluctuate between both. So when the blessing comes down, the way that he shows his appreciation is through sugar, gratitude. And when a calamity comes, which no doubt that it will, he shows the way to deal with and combat it is through suffering. So these is the two states that you're always going to go through. And this statement of a Hassan Abbasi is not from himself. He got it from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says what? Ejiba the Amr of Mu'min. Right? Amazing is the affair of a believer. And this is not the case except for a believer. Right? If he is tried, right, with a hardship or a calamity, he shows patience. And that is good for him. If he is blessed and fortunate from Allah with something good, a network, then he shows gratitude. And that is best for him. Alright? So those two states are something that you always want to go and fluctuate throughout. All right? So all your problems may not disappear, but you will know how to cope with them. I just wanted to make that understood so we don't have a misunderstanding. All right, I'm getting ready to stop with the introduction. All right. But we'll also heal you, fix all your ailments, and make your life a better life, meaning that you'll be able to cope with it. But how indeed does the Quran help you heal? When we talk about healing, it could be of two kinds. One, healing all your physical ailments, and two, healing, healing your soul. The beauty of the Qur'an is that it does both. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says that we have sent down the Qur'an and it is a healing and a mercy for those who believe. Alright? Allah did not say, لِلْنَاسِ <laughs> It's a beautiful point here. Allah said it is a healing and a mercy for those who believe specifically and not for the people. Mankind, right? Because the believers are those who are the ones who's going to accept the message anyway and understand the importance of it. All right? Not all of mankind will. Uh, he says, Say that it is, meaning the Quran, as for those who believe, a guidance and a healing. Allah says, Ya you have asked, O people, for the Jaakum or Ibn Sumi or people, when she found you have this door. Allah says, O oh people, indeed there has come to you a ammunition from the Lord, meaning the book of Allah, wa shifa'an, and it is a shifa, a healing, for that which is in your breast. And it is a guidance, but notice what he says, it's a rahma lil mu'minin. Again, mercy for the believers. Alright? Uh, so we see from these verses that the Quran serves as a what? A coping mechanism. The Qur'an helps us cope with life. One of my favorite verses in the Qur'an, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah does not place upon a person more than what he or she can be. Right? And then the Allah teaches that beautiful dua, ربنا لا تواء. There you go. Do not bring us, do not take us account for that which we what, forget or we do purposely. And do not place upon us a burden which we are not able to bear. So whatever problem that you are going through, Allah knows it, Allah decrees it, and Allah allows it, and Allah knows that it was telling me for you. It was not too overwhelming that you cannot experience. All right? <clears throat> Now, for those who deny this, we know that it's disbelief. But those who have doubt about it, it doesn't mean disbelief, but it means having bad thoughts about the law. And we will talk about that in one of the coping mechanisms. This is why the Prophet some teaches us what? Be optimistic. Always look at a problem multiple different ways. Don't look at it as this, this overwhelming problem that you have. All right? The World Health Organization, which is known as WHO, for short, Define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. 
and not merely the absence of disease or deformity. In line with this definition, it can be understood that a healthy person is one who is free from any physical or mental illness or any social deviation. Physical illnesses are those affecting normal functions of the body. You get ready, I'm gonna take a break. Uh, of the body. Mental illnesses are those affecting the mind, while social deviations are abnormal behaviors and conditions of interpersonal relationships. In addition to these, there are spiritual illnesses which affect a person's mind, feelings, and character, all of which relate to faithfulness and the deed. For those who experience any form of addiction, for those of our brothers and sisters who suffer from any form of addiction, whether it's a drug addiction or whatever, alcohol addiction or whatever, you will find that when you go to any group that helps you deal with it, the number one thing that they use as the term to help you cope with it and help you get off of it is faith. Mm -hmm. It's one of the strongest agents. It's nothing that can go with it. Even in finance and economics, in the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, he has a whole chapter dedicated to faith. And even though he wasn't a believer, he still understood the importance of conviction. Faith has that impact. And we learned that from the boy and the king, Soto Baruch, right? How strong faith is, okay? When they were throwing the people in the ditch, all right? So faith is a strong component, brothers and sisters. Do not overlook it. It helps you to look, to look through life and to be able to deal with it. Uh, we'll take a break now, inshallah, and then uh, we'll give out all of the information afterwards for the up class of the week, inshallah. Uh,